So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 today. And what you're going to need to know about this particular chapter is right before there's kind of a famous chapter. It's Hebrews chapter 11. And in this chapter, the writer of Hebrews talks down through the ages of these heroes of the faith. It's called the Hall of Faith. And he talks about Abraham, and he talks about different judges, and he talks about Rahab, and all these different ones who had ridiculously hard things that they needed to live through and keep their faith, and they did. And now the writer is talking to this group of Hebrew Christians, and they are getting to the point of exasperation. They want to give up. They're having conflicts outside of themselves. They're having conflicts within their group. And they're beginning to ask the question, man, is this worth it? Like, is it worth it to follow Jesus? Should I just go back? I mean, maybe life was a little bit easier when I didn't have all this hardship that kind of came at me because I was a Christ follower. So we need to know that's what the writer was saying to them. And I think we need to receive it to us. Because in some ways, I feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, in our generation now, we're even worse at suffering well. Like suffering is not a part of our paradigm for many of us. Like most of our lives, we're thinking if, if anyone anywhere is suffering, there's some kind of injustice being done. And we're going to see that's not always the case, that suffering is a part of life on planet Earth. And so let's pick it up, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by a great, such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, the witnesses that he's talking about, these are the, the ones he just talked about in chapter 11, okay? Right, like, so Abraham, the judges, these different ones down through the ages. Is it true that there's a great cloud of witnesses that can see us all the time from heaven and they're kind of in the stands cheering us on? I think there's some merit to that perspective. We talked about that in a previous series on heaven. But just so we're clear in context, he's talking about the cloud of witnesses he just mentioned, the specific ones, the ones who, dude, they didn't just die and go to heaven, but, but they killed it while they were here. Like, they didn't lose heart. They kept going. And he says, these are the ones... <clears throat> We, we can't say specifically just how much people know in, in heaven or how much they see, but we can say in some sense, these ones are cheering the rest of us on and saying, don't give up, don't lose heart, you keep going. <clears throat> Picking it back up in verse one, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. How many know that sin slows us down? It creates problems in our lives. In, in the midst of the race that we're trying to run, dude, that's just like throwing a weight around your neck. That's just going to make everything harder. And let us, here we go, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. That means he didn't even really pay attention to it. He didn't even consider it significant. He's like, pfft, whatever, whatever. I don't even care about this pain because I'm focused on the joy set before him. He was focused on the reward of his suffering, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Hey, have you got some problems with people out there, the writer says? Are, are, are you enduring some opposition from others? Hey, you just consider the one who endured the most opposition from others so much that they killed him on a cross so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding your blood like Jesus did. Verse five, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? Notice he shifts right now. He was talking about a race. We're gonna pull that apart in a second. But now he shifts the motif here. And he says, let me talk to you about your father. We go from race to father. And he says, have you completely completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship. Anybody got some hardship going on? Yeah, well, if you don't have some now, sorry to say, spoiler alert, it won't be long, my friend, Okay. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? And if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good. In addition, 
uh, in order that we may share in his holiness. We'll end here on verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, somebody say later on. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and the peace and peace for those who have been trained by it. For the race marked out for us. Do you know that you have your own particular race? Like there is a specific will, there's a specific race, there's a specific obstacle course that is not random that your heavenly father has set out for you. And so the word picture is here, it's this great race, it's this great contest, okay? And this, this race where it actually has to do with agony, okay? So it's not just like, oh, it's a friendly little jog. No, it's, it's an agonizing wrestling match contest. Picture yourself on the hill at the start of the race, and you can see down the hill, and you can see the obstacle course that is laid out before you. And you can see, you don't know everything about it, but you know there's going to be some tough stuff out there, man. Right? Like there's going to be some hardship. There's going to be things you didn't see necessarily. You didn't expect that to be there, but that's there. You didn't expect some of the drama you were going to have in this realm of your life. You thought this thing over here would be a little bit easier, but you can see a lot of that obstacle course, a lot of that race uh, that you are going to be in. And it's not always, and so, some of it's going to feel like a little bit ridiculous. When I was a kid, my parents wouldn't get us cable. So instead, I would go to my friend Eric's house and we would watch Nickelodeon. Now, Nickelodeon, for those of you who know, man, that's like the, the kids' station. And back in the day when you didn't have a bazillion things you could watch on Netflix, okay, and you kind of had to wait if you wanted to watch something, all right, there was this, there was this amazing show called Double Dare. How many know about Double Dare? <laughs> Excuse me. Double Dare is like a kid's dream, man, because we're used to watching all these adult game shows, you know, where there's a wheel and they turn the letters or whatever, but they're all adults. Kids finally got their own game show. And in this game show, kids get to get dirty. They get all the prizes, like you can get slimed in this show or whatever. You get to, you know, go up these different obstacles. And sometimes you even get to crawl through, like, ginormous food, okay? So, like, you're crawling through these waffles, and you can probably take a little taste on your way through, right, as you're trying to win. And as I, I'm watching this as a kid, I'm like, man, that would be, what, what a fun obstacle course. Some of it's a little ridiculous. It's like, how is this even in her giant man-sized waffles? That's strange, in the same way, you have an obstacle course, and some of it's fun, but some of it feels a little bit ridiculous in your life. You're like, what is this doing here? How did this trial even happen? And after a while, it can build up to where we're getting weary. We're beginning to almost lose heart. We're saying, man, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of my own sin. Maybe that's beating us down. I'm sick of other people's sin. Sometimes it's much easier to see other people's sin than to see our own sin. So I'm getting sick of your sin, by the way. Congratulations. I'm getting sick of the sorrow, maybe this is you, sick of the sorrow that is in the world. See, there's a lot of brokenness out, of there, out there and it keeps hitting me. It keeps hitting my life. It keeps hitting my kids and I'm getting sick of it. I'm getting sick of all these circumstances that I didn't ask for and yet I still have to deal with this stuff. And we're looking at this agonizing obstacle course out ahead of us and we're tempted to lose heart. So the writer of Hebrews says, you need to make sure that you don't lose heart and he's gonna teach us how. He's gonna teach us how to have perseverance as we keep our eyes on the one who already completed the race he's the cherry on top and in chapter 11 he talked about all these different saints through the ages who man they they finished their course but there's an ultimate champion of that course and it's jesus christ he's the cherry on top he's the one who ultimately finishes every race and he's the one we're being told to look to to learn perseverance so three things to remember in spiritual discouragement when you feel like throwing in the towel when you feel like, oh, man, I'm about done. I'm just so tired of this. Life is getting so hard. I'm so sick of these people. I'm so sick of this th same thing going the same way. Or I'm just so sick of the amount of stuff that's all pressed together. How do we keep going here? If you're getting discouraged, this message is for you. So number one, God is a coach. For those of us who've had a good coach, maybe you can resonate with this. What does a good coach do? A good coach applies a certain amount of pressure, a certain amount of resistance to make us stronger and smarter and better. That's what a good coach does, right? Like that's what, um, if, if, even if you're trying to coach yourself, even if you go into the gym and you want to get stronger, well, you don't just flap around, right? You don't just dance, and, oh, I think I'm getting in better shape. You can't do just that. You've got to grab something heavy, 
So you grab some dumbbells, and what do you do? You apply some resistance. It's not as easy as just going up and down. It's like, I'm going to make it harder on myself. And this is actually like breaking down my muscles right now. It's making me weaker in a sense, but it's also making me stronger. It's going to make the next time I do it much, much easier. So I embrace exercise. I embrace coaching, whether through someone else or through myself, to get my body stronger. That's how it works in the natural, and that's how it works in the spiritual too. God allows a certain amount of difficulty, and even we'll call it suffering, to come into our life in order to train us. And this is where it gets a little bit hard. Because according to this agony word, there's a lot of life. This race, there's a lot of it that's hard, that's suffering, that's agony. And God is going to use it to make us stronger. Now, the Bible says a lot about suffering, and I need us to understand it doesn't only just say one thing about suffering. So let's start with one thing, and then we'll move on to another thing. Sometimes I get a little bit afraid when people present one truth of Scripture, like it's the only truth of Scripture, and there's not other things also going on. So I'm telling you ahead of time, there's other things going on. But let's look at the first one. And the first one is, in a certain way, we need suffering. And God uses suffering to make us stronger. John Newton, the famous writer of the hymn, Amazing Grace, many of you know that he was a slave trader before he gave his life to Christ. And so he's a guy of of some insight, and he writes this. He says, everything is necessary that God sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. Isn't that interesting? I mean, if that's true, everything that is necessary, God sends. And if you don't have it, it wasn't necessary. That's quite a paradigm shift for some of us to say, if I'm experiencing any kind of suffering, there's a sense in which God has sent this. And he's doing this to to coach me, to make me better and stronger. Now, that's a really hard one. So I would encourage you, when you see your friend or loved one suffering, it shouldn't be your first reaction to say, hooray! (laughs) God has sent this suffering. That's probably, you, like, you can tell them that after they've, like, you know, if they've calmed down a little bit, okay, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a time where we need to start contemplating that, but it's probably not the first 10 minutes, okay? So just, just give them some space, and, and re- remember that there's other things that are true about suffering in the Bible, okay? On the other hand, it's also true that God hates suffering. It's not God's fault that there even is suffering. Like, the world God made didn't include suffering. We're the ones through our sin that brought suffering into the planet. God is actually the only one who has a good plan for suffering. God is getting rid of suffering, and he used the cross of Jesus Christ to be the catalyst to start that. But God can say, well, suffering was going to happen anyway because of what you guys did. I'm going to use this suffering. I'm going to engineer it in your life to make you better, to make you stronger, to make you smarter, because that's what a good coach does. Think about Jesus, okay? Jesus was so human as God, God the Son. He sees his friend Lazarus. He understands Lazarus has died. And now Jesus knows as he goes to Lazarus' tomb, dude, he knows he's going to raise him from the dead. He already knows this. He doesn't roll up to the tomb and be like, well, God works everything together for good. Like, that's not what he said. Remember what he did? He wept. Suffering was real to Jesus. Now, what some translations point out that some don't do so well at, at pointing out, not only did he weep, but Jesus was angry. And he was angry at death. He was angry. He knew I'm about to raise this guy from the dead, but I'm mad at death. I'm mad at suffering. This is not the way I designed it to go for humans. So I got to fix this. Jesus was able to say, I use all suffering, but I don't like suffering. It's not that I enjoy people's pain. And if you can hold those two in tension, you'll be doing pretty well. We've all seen this in the past, right? We understand I've got to have a certain amount of suffering. And often when people go through suffering, on the other side, they'll say, well, you know, God really used it to show me what was meaningful. They'll be like, you know, I I don't know. Like my family means more to me now after I went through that, right? My relationships, like it's not all about, you know, the goals and all that kind of thing. When people suffer, there is a clarity that comes to our eyes, but it's hard to accept these realities all at the same time. Here's what another theologian, George MacDonald, It's in the 19th century. This is what he writes. It's a little hard to understand. He says, everything difficult, so all suffering, everything difficult points to more than our theory of life embraces. And what he's saying is, when you're stressed out, when you're suffering, and you begin to like fall apart, like you just can't handle it, like your life implodes because of this suffering, he's saying what that's showing you is that your theory of reality does not match the real world. 
Because in the real world, that suffering is there. And it was always there. It was an illusion that that wasn't going to happen. Here's, here's, what, we, here's what we ought to know, folks. According to the Bible, suffering is a thing. It happens. And, and we can have all the marches we want to, and we should do as much good on this planet as we can, but suffering is not something you can remove from the planet unless you remove all the sinners from the planet. Okay? Like it is a consequence of sin, and it is here and is happening, but God is going to use it for his good, for your good, and for his glory. But what he's saying is, hey man, if, if your whole like thing in life, if the point of your life is, hey man, you know, I'm an American in the 21st century, so I'm just going to maximize my happiness. That is, the, that is the focus. That is the point of my life. I'm just going to minimize my suffering. If you have to be happy, when suffering comes along, it is going to wreck you because it doesn't care. Like suffering is just going to say, oh, that's your theory? Boom. I don't care. And if that's all you had was, well, I'm, I'm happy as long as I don't suffer at all, baby, that thing's going to come crumbling down. That's, a, that's, a, that's not a good theory of reality to say, I'm just here to maximize my happiness. Because as soon as suffering comes along, suddenly you have no happiness. Unless suffering was already a part of your paradigm. So when Kenzie and I were about 21, we planted this church. And it went well for a little while, but we were young and naive and, you know, we had some theories about how it would work. Hey man, if you're just optimistic, you know, if you're just walk in faith and you just work really hard, you know, people are basically good and this thing's going to go well. And what happened after about a year was that church plant fell apart. Unfortunately, I'd invited a guy into leadership that was kind of a scoundrel and I didn't really understand that, didn't have a grid for that at that time. And so he caused some trouble and the whole thing came down. And I'm, I'm, I'm in the rubble of this thing after a year. I'm like, what happened? And over the next few years, God began to show me, your theory of reality was a little off, Carter. It wasn't completely off, but it was a little off. Yeah, you, you do have to be full of faith. You gotta be optimistic. You gotta work hard. You had those things down. What you didn't have down was, if you're gonna try something hard, you need really smart people in the room. And you didn't have enough of that. And by the way, you, need, you were too careless with the, the evil that you did see, you didn't take it seriously enough. Like, that's a thing, and that will crush you. That will oppose my work. So what was wrong? My theory of reality was wrong. And so instead of receiving it as a failure, it was just a, oh, you only had half the recipe. And for some of us, I would just give that to you and say, is it possible? It's not that you're a failure. It's that you haven't had the full recipe. Your theory of reality hasn't been complete, and God is trying to use some of your circumstances to teach you, well, you got these, but you also need these. Or you're including this, and that needs to go. It doesn't mean that you're bad. It just means you are a child in God's eyes. And children need to be trained. Somebody say, man, if it's this good, I'm coming every week. 